Ellen Guardian with our broadcasting associates, SAFM and SABC News. I am Fundi Swambutra, Head of Insurance Marketing at Standard Bank. Firstly, let me express my gratitude and appreciation to everyone who made it through the Senton morning rush. I understand that it's very difficult to get here. Some of us have actually traveled far. Um, I think we would all be in agreement that the weather has been acting kind of strange lately. Um, in the past week alone, we've seen quite a number of uh, severe thunderstorms um, over consecutive days, and there's been like downpours that have actually happened in many parts of the country. We have also seen how some of these storms have affected us in different ways. Various news outlets have actually reported the devastation felt in many communities due to, to the recent floods. And there's also been major losses that resulted in displacements of our fellow citizens. So with these recent events, I do actually want us to recall the impact some of these have, ha have had on us. And uh, we will also be having experts today who will delve deeper into the cumulative effect of these uh, severe weather patterns to the insurance industry and also the consumers at large. So to unpack, to unpack this in detail, we'll be hearing from Mr. Johan van Grieneng, who is the CEO of Standard Insurance, who is on my far left, Standard Insurance Limited. We also have Dr. Andris Kruger, who is the chief scientist at the South African Weather Services. Um, and in the middle, we do have Ms. Dora Marema, who's port portfolio head, um, municipal sustainability at the South African local, local government, that is SALGA, uh, for those who actually go with the abbreviation. Um, can I ask that we actually have, uh, give a round of applause to our panelists that are sitting with me today. So my nerves that you're actually seeing right now, it's to help ease the pressure and just bring it on my side because the spotlight is going to be on them and not on me. Um, so the second part of the conversation is actually going to be facilitated by uh, our professional broadcasters that are going to join us in the room. But the contributors from that session, we've got Dr. Hadi Mube, and I'm actually going to ask him to please stand up so that you can all see him. Uh, he is Head of Personal Insurance at Standard Insurance Limited. And he's also going to be joined by Mr. Shaka Zwana, who is Head of uh, Insurance and Fiduciary at Standard Bank. And uh, with uh, him is also Dini Nondumo, who is Head of Commercial Insurance at Standard Insurance Limited. We also do have another panelist who is going to be joining us later, but she is attending to an emergency outside, and that is Professor Jennifer Fitchett, who is a professor of uh, physical geography uh, from the Wits University of, uh, sorry, from the University of Witwatersrand. Um, so a big warm welcome, uh, everyone in the room. I do appreciate your presence. So as you can hear that there is, there has been limited in some of the titles that I have presented today. And what it actually means is the scope of this conversation today is limited to insurance. Uh, so any bank related queries uh, will not necessarily be able to address them on this platform, but I know that we have consultants in the bank who can assist. So you're welcome to share those questions. Uh, and we'll be able to address them offline, but are not on this forum right now. The conversation is strictly on insurance. Um, so the sessions then will be facilitated by Kathy Mutlachana, and I did mention that she is a seasoned, seasoned broadcaster at SAFM. We also have Oliver Dixon. So Kathy is facilitating the first part of the broadcast and then followed by uh, Oliver Dixon for the second part. Now, it is a live broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. So what that means is in a moment, you will be hearing news from SAFM and that will be carried live in this room. Um, and that means that every 30 minutes, there will be then a break to news headlines for the duration of this program. The session is also streaming live on Mail and Guardian and also SABC News. Uh, so we do welcome engagement on the floor. Like I said, it is limited to insurance. Uh, we are a bank that is there to help you. But uh, for the purpose of our discussion today, um, I will I would like to ask that we actually just for managing time, we stick to the, the, the topic in hand. Um, then in addition to that, uh, due to time, uh, I would like you to, if you have any contributions to make on the floor, uh, that you keep it succinct because um, time is of the essence when you're actually in broadcasting. Um, in the event that you actually need to make your way out of the room, um, there is a door right at the end where you actually entered. Uh, my colleague will be able to assist you in, in the event that you have emergencies and you need to step out. Uh, I would also like that you remain seated. Um, the, like I said, there is a live stream, so there's cameras in the room, and that is to help the audience uh, that is viewing from the different digital platforms uh, to follow the discussion without any disruptions. 
if you absolutely have to exit, please just be mindful of the cameras um, so that we don't obstruct. Um, also, if you have your phone on, uh, please, can you please put it on vibrate? Uh, please do not answer your calls while you are in the room. It will be disruptive. But I think we can all look forward to what is going to be a very insightful conversation on insurance matters and some of the severe weather patterns that we have experienced in the past and how we navigate that from an industry perspective, but also as consumers. I have been told that the temperature in the room is forecast at 18 and a maximum of 21 degrees. So I am looking at our actuaries in the room and uh, they have actually told me that it is an acceptable range uh, to keep us all engaged. So please remain seated, as I've said. Uh, Kathy will be joining us soon, and in a moment we'll be hearing the news. I do thank you and hope you enjoy yourself today.
It's seven after 10 o'clock. Welcome to the second hour of the Talking Point. I did promise that today was a special broadcast. We're coming to you live from the Leonardo Hotel in Santon. Of course, we are in partnership with Standing Bank Insurance and the Mail and Guardians Thought Leadership Series. And today we're really turning the spotlight onto the issue of climate change. I am joined by an incredible panel of experts that are really going to help contextualize what the climate change problem that we are facing as a society is and bring it back home to how we as South Africans um, are really impacted by it and what are the measures we need to put in place uh, to better protect ourselves um, going into the future. I suppose it really is about building re resilience into the system in many ways to mitigate against the future effects. We are in a room that is full of an audience. Everybody seems to be on their best behavior today. I hope that you're going to relax a little bit more because uh, it's part of the conversation. So later on in this hour, I'll also be giving you an opportunity to ask uh, our panelists some questions and also share some of the insights that you have because I know that we've got uh, some really senior industry experts um, in the insurance sector. Before we go any further, let me perhaps begin by setting the context for why we're having this conversation in the first place. It's something that many South Africans would know by now. You look at a province like KZN, over the last four years, we have seen very extreme weather patterns in that province. In fact, it looks like every time there is some kind of path to recovery, there's a setback because the floods have been ongoing and we've all watched the impact. Hundreds of people's, uh, hundreds of people rather losing their homes just after one climate incident. And it takes years and years to be able to rebuild those houses, to rebuild the bulk infrastructure that is affected. It's not just um, the issue of floods. We're also seeing uh, severe weather patterns in terms of drought, water shortages. Uh, we, we're having more and more cyclones within the SADC area. And so all of this paints the backdrop for why this conversation. I'm joined by Johan van Gruening, who is the CEO of Standard Bank Insurance Limited. Um, Johan, good morning to you. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Uh, delighted to be here with you. Also part of our panel this morning, Dr. Dora Marema is Portfolio Head, Municipality Sustainability with the South African Local Government Association, Salga. Good morning, Dora. Good morning. Just to qualify that I'm not a doctor, actually. So I, my initials are DR, so that's why. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why it's important for you to clarify. <laughs> Yeah, you, you don't want to be called a doctor and end up, you know, caught up in all sorts of controversy. Thank you so much um, for that, Dora Marema. And also part of our conversation this morning is Dr. Andres Kruger, who is a chief scientist at the South African Weather Service uh, University of Stellenbosch. Uh, Dr. Kruger, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from the South African Weather Service and I'm actually affiliated to the University of Pretoria. All right. I'm, I'm just going to ask that we check Dr. Kruger's mic, please, um, so that it's positioned correctly. I don't want problems when uh, we get to him and what he has to contribute to this conversation. So, Johan, perhaps let me kick it off with you and give you an opportunity to really set the context for us. You know, of course, we've got lots of potential as a country, as a continent, but we also know that we are the ones that are worst affected by adverse weather, weather events and weather climate. I met, and the resilience in our economies is not quite there yet. So when you think about the future and how we need to be building differently, uh, what are some of the things that immediately come to mind? Thanks for that question. I think it's important um, that from a Standard Bank perspective, um, Africa is considered as uh, one of the biggest uh, growth uh, opportunities on the continent. And I think the key drivers for that um, is, is um, important to understand. And let's start off with that. Um, Africa is um, the youngest and the fastest growing economy. Um, it is estimated that it holds approximately 65% six, 
of the world's remaining um, um, uncultivated arable land. And Africa has got vast uh, renewable um, energy potential and an abundance of minerals uh, remaining um, or available uh, that is critical for energy transition. Um, so by 2030, it's uh, therefore estimate, uh, estimated that Africa will have um, a larger um, um, working age population compared to India and China, um, with a majority of the population below the age of, of 25. And it's these factors that really present um, the immense opportunity for economic growth. I think if we then um, just think of the reason for the conversation today is um, um, what threatens this growth, um, and it's and, and, and it's really so. There are many challenges that are well documented that can um, impact uh, this growth, uh, but not least, climate change is one of uh, uh, the major points. Um, I think, um, as uh, many of you know, that the main reason or the impacts uh, that is um, as a result of climate change is rising uh, temperatures and sea levels. Um, the changing uh, rainfall patterns, and then just the uh, frequency of extreme um, weather e events such as droughts and floods. Um, and it's these severe consequences that affect a, a vast range of, of, of sectors, and these include um, agriculture, energy, and infrastructure. Um, and it's these uh, weather conditions that threat the economic um, situation of households, businesses around the world, and albeit in different ways. All right. Uh, thanks for that context, Johan. Professor Kruger, let me come to you. You know, often the, the conversation that we seem to have a lot when we see adverse weather events is, and experts say, no, this, these are signs of climate change. Others say, but, but what exactly is climate change? How do we know that it's not, it is climate change and it's not just weather patterns that repeat themselves after a set period um, within the environment? Okay, um, to, to um, give an elementary explanation of climate change is that um, since the Industrial Revolution, the industrialization of the world, um, there has been an unabated um, release of greenhouse gases, uh, mainly carbon dioxide. And um, the features of a greenhouse gas is that um, it is able to absorb heat, keep heat, and stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. So since then, there's been a vast, amount of greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere and what one must understand about the greenhouse gas is actually in modest quantities greenhouse gases is actually good for the for the atmosphere and for human life because it keeps the temperature um, at habitable levels at about 15 degrees celsius but if um, you are going to increase the greenhouse gases to since then, up to now, it is by about, I would say, 30%, then obviously something is going to change. And the, the, the change that we see um, that's the most obvious is a warming of the atmosphere. And um, for the few skeptics that remain about climate change, I think um, last year was an eye-opener where it was the hottest year in the instrument, instrumental record, and it was the hottest by quite a wide margin. Mm -hmm. um, so, climate change is a reality. Um, how you can verify that is by looking at uh, weather observations, and you can also look at it by simulating the, the climate through climate models. And if you put in the increased greenhouse gases into the climate models, it tallies very well with what you observe. Mm -hmm. So we are quite confident, we are very confident mm -hmm. that the release of greenhouse gases is the main cause of the climate change that we are experiencing today. What, what is the impact of this that we are seeing more broadly on the continent? And if you can bring it closer to home. Okay. Um, 
because this um, conversation is basically more about um, stream rainfall, I will try to explain it. Um, the, there are two main elements that one must consider. And the first is that global warming is not uniform across the globe. For example, last year was the hottest year on record globally, but not for South Africa. South Africa was about the, the eighth hottest year in, in the instrumental period, where um, the years 2015, 2016, 2019, that, that were actually our hottest years that we experienced. And this differential warming causes a, a change in the atmospheric circulation patterns. Now, what I mean by that is that you have certain kind of weather systems that produce um, more rainfall and others that produce less rainfall, for example, high pressure systems. And if the average size and the position of those systems change over time, then you, you will have some regions experiencing more rainfall and other regions experiencing less rainfall. The other thing that one must take into account is that in a warming atmosphere, warmer air is able to absorb more moisture. And that means that there are more moisture now in the atmosphere than it used to be, like for example, 100 years ago. And this increase in moisture is actually, um, you can say it is uh, making the, the rainfall cycle more extreme. In other words, there are more um, evaporation, more convection, and more rainfall that falls into a certain event. Mm. So what we have found when we analyzed our data of the past 100 years is that when it rains, it rains more. And obviously that will mean that you will have an increase in the likelihood of flash floods that we've seen recently uh, from our observation. The issue of the impact is not just something that is felt by businesses, um, Dora. It's also felt by individuals. And I suppose this is where you as Salga really come in because it speaks to the ability of the infrastructure and the capability of the infrastructure to take on that additional pressure. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen in our municipalities, if Professor Kruger is talking about flash floods, um, our stormwater drains often are incapacitated to deal with it. Uh, speak to me about the vulnerabilities that um, you know you believe our society more general, more generally at a local government level is then exposed to as a result of these changes. So much. Um, thank you so much, um, Kathy, for um, for this question. I think um, the. The, the, the impacts of, of, of climate change are really felt very much at the local level. Um, communities are not able to shoulder the amount of destruction um, that they have to suffer. Many people, um, you know, really lose their livelihood. So when, 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 for example, you've got a flash flood and roads are destroyed, uh, tele telecommunication infrastructure, electricity infrastructure is all abutted. A um, lot of communities are cut off. I think many of us have seen how children are not able to go to school or have to swim in big rivers to be able to cross on the other side. Sick people are not able to go and get to the clinics to get their medication. Um, and, and people can't get to work. And that affects the, the infrastructure in, 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 in the municipality. Um, the local economy, small businesses lose um, their livelihoods and, and their businesses. Um, but again, I think most importantly, communities are uprooted. It's not only the loss of life, those who remain behind then have to be forced to stay in public uh, 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 halls uh, or stay with other relatives. And, and, and sometimes it takes quite a long time uh, for help to be able to arrive because it is a coordinated thing that has to happen afterwards. Farmers lose their crops. Um, they are not able to, they don't have insurance like, like, like other sectors of society to be able to, to, to shoulder the amount of loss. When you've got a drought, you know, farmers as, or small scale farmers or subsistence farmers um, also lose um, their crops and they are not able. So we've also seen uh, as a result of this warmer, hotter climate that there's an infiltration of, uh, of, 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 of pests 
that then attacks their crops. But again, there's opportunistic uh, uh, um, health breaks that then happen after a disaster, for example. Um, and I think when you look at um, all of that, it really compounds uh, an already vulnerable, uh, uh, vulnerable infrastructure at a local level um, that just uh, creates a crisis um, when, when a small municipality that has to respond to something like that. The question that, of course, many people will ask with the picture that is being painted is, what can I do? Because we don't really want to leave our lives to the elements. What can we do practically to better protect ourselves against the effect of global change, uh, I mean, climate change? And Johan, often, you know, we had that hailstorm in Johannesburg last year people's cars were dented, um, so many of them on social media. We saw uh, driveways of complexes seemingly collapsing um, as a result of those flash floods. I'm sure your phone lines are one of those that were ringing off the hook, uh, people wanting to cash in their claims, right? But really, what is it that we can, better do, we can do to better protect ourselves? Thank you. Um, and indeed, these events lead to a significant influx of claims um, um, when these uh, events happen. I think the most important, the uh, um, insurance uh, is just one of the role players uh, that provide uh, the financial aid to speed up re uh, the recovery. Um, but there are um, aspects so, um, of late, you would have seen quite or several announcements and weather warnings that are issued. And these all help um, individuals to plan better. Um, if you see, there's often warnings to, to alert um, individuals to avoid certain low-lying areas when they travel, or when you see that the hail is forecasted, um, it just takes that little bit of planning to say, maybe I stay or I travel later, because you can quite effectively avert being impacted by that. Now, that's easier said than done, but every small step um, taking preventative um, measures can help to reduce the impact. Um, so insurance will always just provide that buffer, but sadly a, a, a large percentage of people remain uh, uninsured. Um, and what we've seen is um, in some events, only about 20% of people in communities actually have access to insurance. Are you finding that as an industry, you're having to adapt to um, the changing weather patterns as well in terms of what you have as your terms and conditions um, within the overall package you're offering to, to customers? I believe one of the most important roles that we play is one of education because it's not just the insurance standalone that can reduce the impact. Um, so it's the extent to which uh, the consumer starts adopting some of the risk mitigating uh, measures um, because it's a collective effort from everybody. Professor Kruger, what is it that, that we can be doing to better protect ourselves from these effects? If you have already built your brick house um, and you've already used certain materials that perhaps are considered not as resilient to flooding as others? I think such an issue must be um, looked at from a disaster management perspective. And um, there are three components to it that one must take into consideration. And that is, what is the hazard? In other words, the size of um, or the magnitude of the rainstorm or event that, that happened? What is the vulnerability of the community? And also, what is the capacity to deal with it? And there are many role players that must um, come to, to to the party, you know, to to solve this problem. You know, we can say, for example, uh, from the weather service side, okay, this is the hazard that we think that's going to occur, and it will be rain so much rainfall in a small space of time, and then we come to, okay, now the community is vulnerable. How vulnerable is the community? Um, is the community more um, affluent in that they have um, housing that is um, fulfilling the building standards and so on, or is it more informal settlements? Is it sit situated in, in flood plains and stuff like that? And then also, you know, um, you have to have um, 
an increase in capacity to deal with these problems. And with that, I mean, is uh, effective communication to, um, to the communities, um, as well as um, uh, a better um, working relationship between um, local government, uh, for example, the weather service, the, uh, the National Disaster Management Council, all those bodies must um, integrate what they are doing um, to make the response more efficient. One of the things that we've seen, and as I'm seeing the pictures that um, are being projected on the screen, these are pictures from um, some of the floods that we've experienced in the in the country over the last uh, sort of 24 months. But what often happens, Professor Kruger, is that people look at floods in an area and they say, well, these houses should have never been built here in the first place. And sometimes it's not just informal settlements, but it's suburbs that have been built. And experts like yourselves will say, well, um, they've been built along the, the flood line because the 100-year flood line came up to X mark. And yet, you know, you've got this beautiful double-story house that's there and it's now collapsed. Yes, that is why it's so important to... Um adhere to municipal regulations and building regulations mm -hmm. and and um for vulnerable communities sometimes they do not have a choice you know where to build um their settlements and so on because they want for example be close to work because of transport costs whatever so there is a from my perspective you know i'm a climatologist i'm not a town planner but um I would say, you know, that um, those things should be considered, you know, um, going forward. Do you think that they are being considered to the extent that they should be? Well, from what we've seen, you know, the disasters that we get, uh, that, that we are observing and the impacts of the disasters, that is, from where I'm sitting, it's not the case, you know, because if you think about the Durban floods, um, um, there's a very nice article written in uh, published in the water wheel magazine um it was authored by professor um Schulze from ukzn and we argued because he's got uh, he is very knowledgeable in the cli rainfall climate of kwazulu natal where he said that most of the rainfall that actually occurred was not unprecedented apart from certain small pockets and the impacts were not as severe as what used to happen in previous um, incidents of that nature and if you look deeper into why um, the impacts were so severe it's got to do with informal settlement um, not proper town planning alien vegetation a removal of vegetation yeah. in some instances all those things it, it's an interdisciplinary thing you know that must uh, uh, engagements that must happen to solve these problems all right uh, thanks for that professor kruger so in a moment i guess then i'll have to give uh, dora the floor to respond then um on the issue of what is happening at a local level that is enabling um, some of the issues that um, andres has raised it's 10 30 it's time for the latest news headlines
All right, we continue the conversation on the talking point. It is a special broadcast in partnership with Stanenbeck Insurance and the Mail and Guardian. It's a thought leadership series. And today we're specifically focusing on the impact of climate change. How is the world changing? And how do how does society, I suppose, uh, public-private partnerships um, respond to it? And most importantly, also the insurance sector and industry, how can it be um, adapting to what is this changing climate? Uh, joining us for this conversation is um, a panel of guests, some of which I've introduced earlier, but uh, for for the benefit of those that are just joining the conversation, I'm joined by Johan van Gruening. He's uh, the CEO of Standard Insurance Limited. It's a short-term insurance arm of the Standard Bank Group. Uh, Dr. Andries Kruger, Chief Scientist at the South African Weather Service, University of Stellenbosch, and Ms. Dora Marema, who is a portfolio head, Municipal Sustainability, uh, with the South African Local Government Association, that is SALGA. So, and in a moment then, I'm also going to be giving our guests in the room an opportunity to engage with our panelists and ask whatever questions may be on your mind. I'm going to ask that when we get the opportunity to do that, please, if you can just introduce yourself which organization you represent and also which panelist in particular you're directing your questions to. Uh, we are live on radio. That is not to add pressure, but it's just so that you can be mindful of the time. If we can keep uh, some of those questions as brief as possible, it will also be helpful. So Dora, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the issues that Andres were raising because it does seem that a lot of the the capacity and the capability that is needed uh, to safeguard communities when it comes to uh, climate change also rests within the local sphere of government. And adherence to municipal regulations is a big one. S proper town planning is, is, is an issue that, that has come up as well. Um, no, definitely. I think the, the, the challenge of uh, climate change is a, is a big one and it requires structural change. In, which is which must happen at an enormous scale and at, at, at a very fast speed. So we no longer cannot afford incremental um, adaptation measures, uh, for example, because you can see that the frequency of this of these disasters um, has just really increased. So what we need is multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary pu public-private partnerships. I mean, there are already some you know some examples. Um, because we know that the private sector has got the skills, has got the experience, uh, has got access to resources. Uh, and I think it is important, we started to have a conversation within Salga to look at innovative uh, public-private partnerships, moving away from business as usual, where you know, local government would look at the private sector as, as a service provider, but actually looking at, a, at, at, at partnerships that would start um, you know, looking at sharing the risk 50-50 to rebuild the infrastructure. Um, and, and I understand what Professor Kruger is saying in terms of, Dr. Kruger is saying in terms of adherence to municipal regulations. What we also need is the transformation of the education, of the education center, uh, sector. How we, are, how we are producing, how we are equipping our planners, our architects. Because um, if you look at what traditionally would be a hundred year flood, I, I believe that, I mean, I just don't have the science, but I believe that it has probably started to kind of backtrack is now 50 years or, or even 10 years. And, and what does that uh, mean for our, 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 our professionalization um, of these of this, of this, of this sectors? So we need um, almost like a reskilling, re-education of those that are in the system, that are in the municipalities, having to approve these plans that, that uh, are presented to them. But again, the new ones that are coming on board. We need to, to be thinking about innovation, the, the 4IR, designing early warnings. We need to be looking at to the, 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 the partnership that will assist to reduce the risk because right now we are concentrating on responding. We need to be moving one step ahead and actually say, given the, the projections of what the IPC is telling us, uh, what are some of the interventions that we can be able to partner to reduce the risk, to reduce the likelihood of loss of life and destruction on the infrastructure? infrastructure. One of the biggest issues has been, Dora, that there's not been um, a strong enough enforcement of regulation. And that is part of why we end up seeing um, 
informal settlements crop up in the way that do, they do, but also formal settlements crop up in the way that they do. Uh, and, and that rests with municipalities. Now, if there is an inability to actually enforce what is in legislation, in the context of a, a public-private partnership, where, would you, where do you see um, the role of the private sector coming in there, where they really, by and large, is, is, is a disregard of, of the, the, the regulations? Um, I think, you know, I spoke about the innovative partnerships. Some of the partnerships that we are, we are, we are exploring is public-public partnerships, uh, uh, municipalities partnering with their communities, because if you think about it, Communities are the ones that are there every day On in terms of when someone start putting in their check, because there's also a, a, a law that says if the people are settled for over a number of hours or, or days, you are not allowed to remove them unless you've got alternative land. Some of the land is private land. It's not necessarily municipal land. And when the owners are not able to give the powers to the municipality to enforce any invasion on that land, then, then, then it becomes a problem to the neighbors. To the, to the neighboring landowners, which most probably will become municipalities. So it is not a very simple uh, uh, way of dealing with it. It needs all sectors, the private sector, to come into partnership with local government. Because I think um, a lot of these things can be resolved. Because if you think about communities that are resettling on rail, next to the railroads, their they land um, there doesn't necessarily belong to the, to the municipality. Mm. But if the landowner is able to partner with the municipality and give the municipality the powers, to be able to to safeguard and to enforce and to to regulate to make sure that there is no invasion or mm -hmm. as soon as they see invasion that police are able to be sent to make sure that the people are removed then we can be able to 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 um uh, to deal with some of the issues mm -hmm. and, and i think because traditionally there's been a, a, a just a one sided way of partnering the other partnerships is with communities uh, that can adopt um, they are, you know, adopt their, their, their public spaces, adopt their communities to be able to partner with the municipality and doesn't require an exchange of, of funding. So it's a simple kind of partnership that says to the community, we would like to partner with you to be able to do A, B, C, D and to become our eyes. When we think about the, the, the ways that end up clogging our, 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 our stormwater drainage is because people are littering waste everywhere. And um, if there, there is a partnership between communities and municipality where communities are being incentivized to be able to raise the alarm when someone is dumping the waste, at, meaning there is some kind of a reward that you are able to start to see the change because by the time a municipal worker arrives on the scene, then you have a mountain of a problem. Johan, where do you as the sector fit in into this conversation that includes public-private partnerships. And, and often I'm, I become very reluctant when I hear the word, you know, multi-sectoral approach. Because often what that means is that there's a lot of people in the room saying a lot of things, but in, at the end of the day, nobody wants to take actual accountability and responsibility for the kind of progress um, that is needed on an issue because it's a shared responsibility, you know. So, Johan, as the insurance sector... Where do you see yourselves um, in this conversation? And, and as a potential partner, what is the role that you believe um, in this organizations like yourselves uh, can be playing? Thanks, and I think it's important. So insurance industry really helps to fast track uh, the speed at which recovery can take place. So I think um, on, on our side, make sure that we provide cover and it's and and, and quite often um, the education element is because there are ways that communities can engage in uh, risk um, improvement measures uh, which doesn't necessarily cost uh, cost money so it is through uh, that educational role but then uh, also making sure that we can react uh, quickly and as quickly as possible. So after an, an event, the most important thing is actually to return the economic contributing uh, community uh, back to their jobs as quickly as possible. And I think just getting businesses back on track, making sure that we are able to secure or, or safeguard job losses um, is the biggest role that we play. Is there a, a checklist, um, Johan, that we as individuals or even businesses need to be mindful of when it comes to the kind of insurance cover that they have and making sure that 
that is updated um, to keep up with, again, what is a changing climate? So one of the most important aspects is to engage with um, your insurance service provider. So um, um, the insurers invest in advanced models that enable them to better understand the risks. And it's through the advice that they can provide to customers to help engage and implement um, 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 strategies to reduce their risk exposure. All right. Let me move this conversation then to the floor and get some questions from our audience that is in the auditorium. Um, I see we do have two roving mics. If you can just maybe by way of, oh, we've got one mic, apologies, by way of just raising your hand. And as I said, you can introduce yourself and uh, let me know who you want to answer your question. Perfect. Uh, good morning, all. Um, this is Poka Ziputini. I come from Standard Bank Group, and my question is for Johan. Um, and thank you to the panel at wide um, for the insights. I mean, it's pretty clear that climate change poses quite a risk to not only um, us as a you know as a society, but also in the insurance industry specifically. So, Johan, for me, I just I'm trying to think of you know where the bright spark is. I'm trying to be half glass full optimistic. So perhaps my question to you is: Where are the opportunities uh, for the insurance industry um, in in dealing with our clients? Perhaps do we want to design product better and or maybe there's a client engagement strategy that we want to employ going forward that will see a positive change specifically for the industry thanks so one of the most important aspects is ongoing product innovation and there are several metrics that can help um, in the product side um, so the traditional products is um, you get a solution and you have to take the full bucket um, in order to get protection but the most important is, is to provide the most elementary cover possible. So um, to uh, provide access to everybody. So one of our, our focuses specifically is how we can modularize product, product design. So to provide that customization. So not the one size fits all solution to everybody. Um, and we've embarked on a great journey to do that. So that when we engage clients, we can look at the specific needs of the client and then design a solution that can address the um, at the heart the, the most uh, important aspect, so especially in business. So what is the biggest risk that a business faces and how we can make sure that we provide that cover? Does that also include, Johan, and, and, and I know that this is often um, a bit of a hot potato because there are there is a segment of our population that often is described as the unbankables, right? People who find it difficult to open bank accounts and have access to the traditional um, sort of system. Those are the same people who, when it comes to insurance, um, it's a product that is also highly inaccessible for them. Is the kind of challenge that we're facing with climate change such that institutions like yourself also need to develop or think of developing products that reaches uh, those those constituencies and those markets too? So it's obviously uh, the conundrum question, but the importance is that you start or that, that we provide solutions uh, to the SME and the small, um, so to every individual. Um, um, so if you think of small SME banks, how you can offer the most elementary solution mm -hmm. to that business. Um. Okay. Let me go to more questions from our audience. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chrissy Dubey from Good Governance Africa. And my question is directed to Dora. In terms of uh, municipalities, we have seen, and you've mentioned as well, drainage blockages and other things that cause water damage during, um, you know, climate change, flooding, and normal rains. Is there any mechanisms in terms of accountabilities being put in place for municipalities to make sure that they are maintaining infrastructure um, as basic as drainages, as this has been a problem, you know, and it's recurring? Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for this question. I think, you know, we have recognized that some of the interventions are really very basic, um, um, as, as basic as just 
cleaning out your your your, your drainage system. So yes, there are there are there are uh, programs and there is a support that we run. So every time, um, you know, we 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 see a, a forecast of a of a heavy rain or a flooding, uh, as Salga, we send out a note uh, to all our municipalities in that area to remind them to you know to clean up the you know the 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 the, the drainages. Uh, you know, it sounds like something that is that is that is uh, mundane, but it's very important that if you know that there is. Uh, going to be a huge storm coming your way that you are able to clean up the drainage that you are able to stock up on the sandbags to create you know uh, barriers and um, uh, to protect some of the infrastructure and to make sure that um you know you are able to run but one, one of the things that i want to point out is that the amount of the rainfall in many cases is not being able to you know the, the infrastructure the, the the drainages are not equipped to be able to handle the amount of the rainfall that 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 is that is uh, coming right now with the with the heavy rains that uh, municipalities are facing, so that is just the one element. So besides the efforts to to clear out the drainages, they find that the intensity um, of the rain uh, is such that the, the 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 systems that are already in place are not able to cope. Andres, if if we have to think about in innovation in the space and I, I hear Dora talking about you know the fact that they are the systems that they have the communication that they have but we all know what is happening in our municipalities uh, so in as much as uh, you know Saga will be able to say yes you know we sent out notes and told the municipalities to clean out the the, the stormwater drains it's not happening um, and so when then we we have to think about innovative solutions with what we have now what what where would where would some of those need to look into because the reality is that as things stand it's going to take years to change the infrastructure that we have but the the floods are not going to stop because we're still working on a plan or we're still working for waiting for universities to produce a certain level of of town planners that are going to bring the kind of solution that that we need that that is a very difficult question <laughs> <laughs> because uh, i'm not sure what what local government will be able to do you know with old infrastructure and old drainage systems and so on i think that is a question that only an engineer can effectively answer mm. because it will require to adjust or improve on what is already there because to actually replace it according to new um, standards and so on you know it is um, financially you know it's impossible to do you know so i'm not sure what steps can be taken you know in the meantime you know to to actually um, alleviate that but what I can also say in that regard is that the standards that are currently in use has been, they have been um, developed many, many years ago. And it's high time that those standards are actually updated with new um, rainfall and drainage data and so forth. Mm. And so that all new developments that's taking place, you know, can, can be designed according to new standards. Mm. I think that that will be possibly um, a, an important one that can bring about change uh, sooner. All right, let me take more questions from the floor. Good morning. Uh, my name is Calvin from Standard Bank Insurance. I have a question for Dora and uh, Andres. Uh, we see a lot of um, uh, an impact on uh, on pollution and climate change as a result of uh, livestock farming because of methane gas emissions. Do you guys see, you know, any solution that we could identify for South Africa? Okay, I'll try to, to give perspective on, um, on the methane story. Um, the biggest problem that we have regarding methane is, um, um, I suppose you all know about the Paris Agreement that wants to um, Sort of limit um, global warming to a level of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And during the past year, two months, it actually you know breached that um, that um, threshold. 
And one of the consequences of that is that if you look globally, the one region in the in the world that is warming the fastest is the um, northern latitudes, um, like Siberia and those places. And it's got a lot of uh, the, the 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 surface is basically a lot of it is covered by permafrost, which um, traps or, or um, stores uh, vast amounts of methane. And if we are we are on our way to breach that 1.5 degrees Celsius, I think that it, it is going to be breached over the medium term, actually. And the methane that is um, produced by agriculture will actually be dwarfed by that amount of methane that will be will be released by the thawing of the permafrost in the northern latitude. So I think that is more something more to worry about is to curb that um, increase, you know, to try and mitigate climate change in that way instead of you know. Um, um, Obviously, agriculture is also important, but it is in scale. It is not comparable to what is happening. In the Dora, yeah, I think just to support uh, um, uh, uh, Doctor is that the I think the the amount of methane generated by agriculture at this stage, in terms of our contribution towards the global uh, uh, was the greenhouse gas emission. I think. It, probably might be minuscule. I think the prophet, the, the doc has just said that. Uh, and I think we need to look at, if you're talking about pollution, uh, what kind of pollution are we talking about? I think our biggest contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions is probably energy production. Um, and I think that's where we need to look at. And I think then you've got transport uh, that follows, which is why we've been lobbying for rail, that a lot of goods be moved from the road to the rail. So there is a, a cascading um, of the contributions that are made uh, by the various sectors. And I think livestock farming at this stage is probably a little bit lower. And I think we are just worried about dealing with the fossil fuels uh, contributions towards the green gas, green, greenhouse gas emission. All right. Um, thanks for that. Let me take more questions from the floor. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Mitchell Black. I am the head of policy and research alignment from Rise Mzanzi in Gauteng. We need to refer to this as a crisis, first and foremost. Language matters. And I'm sure that my learned colleagues on the panel will agree that we are outstripping all available models. The permafrost that you indicated is one of several tipping points that we have not included in the climate models that, say, the Paris Agreement was based on. We are going to and are blowing past all of our current measurements. It is important that we realize this. Second, we have to realize that the vast majority of South Africans live in a state defined by precarity. Even the insured are one extreme weather event away from poverty, away from destitution. Moreover, where we have households that are built not generational wealth in the bank, but generational wealth in terms of a couch was bought by an uncle, a bed was bought by a grandmother. We are assembling homes and homesteads over generations. This is the challenge that we are facing. But more so, we need to acknowledge that this is a systemic issue across the board. We mentioned methane in agriculture. In agriculture alone, methane is not the biggest problem. We are talking about the entire value chain that supports current agriculture. My question is now. So there's not much that the everyday individuals can do besides putting pressure on their service providers to make smart climate choices. And the question that I want to ask to the panel, whoever wants to take it, is what can the insurance industry do to place pressure on the drivers and the actors behind the climate crisis, right? What can you do to help turn the ship? All right, thanks for that question. Um, I'll give it to you, Johan, because I think it's more in, in, in your line of work. Before I do, um, Andres, is it a, a crisis, as he's saying? Are we using the wrong language for it? Yes, I tend to agree with what, what his sentiment is. Okay. Yes. Johan? So no doubt um, the cost of insurance continues to increase. And the only uh, way that it impacts the consumer is 
is through rising premiums. So the pressure really comes to act decisively. So if a business or individual um, uh, is not interested in adopting um, measures that can help them um, reduce the risk exposure, it ultimately culminates in them experiencing the financial consequence thereof. So the pressure from the industry is, um, is, is kind of two, uh, two ways. On the one side, for those consumers um, are not interested or, or not embracing the, uh, the real measures, because as insurer, you can educate, you can provide advice, but, but it's through the partnership to say, here are the measures that you need to take to help reduce the implications um, uh, of the losses. So my simple uh, response would be one of partnership and one through education, because that drives ultimately, um, by not embracing it, it leads to that increase in premium and ultimate uninsurability. So the consequences is far more dire um, if no action is taken. Part of what I also understood him to be asking is, do you as, as a sector see a role for yourselves in putting pressure on the municipalities that Doro was speaking about? Because if the stormwater drain is not cleaned up and we have a flash flood, um, my car then gets caught up in that drama. The next person I'm calling is you, Johan. So are you going to, or do you at any point have a conversation with Dora to say, but Dora, you, you, you know, you're, you're creating more problems for me this side. Please try and, and clean your stormwater drains. I think those conversations are ongoing. Uh, but needless to say, I think we must acknowledge that a lot more can be done. Um, the speed and, and, and the ability to, to, to action um, and to enable local government is also dependent on financial resources. So uh, as much as we point one finger or finger in one direction, it's a societal um, um, issue that we all need to work together and see how best we can alleviate the pressure. All right. So in a moment, then, we'll be concluding our conversation looking at the impact of climate change and how it is affecting um, the insurance industry, but also how it is affecting society. We'll continue with that in a moment. It is now time for your latest news update. It's 11 o'clock.
It's five after 11 o'clock. We continue the conversation on the talking point. Welcome to the third and final hour of the show. In a moment, of course, we're going to be focusing on government's land reform pro, uh, program and looking at some of the challenges um, that it has been facing. But before we get to that, uh, we're going to conclude our conversation, part of our special broadcast with Standard Bank Insurance and the Mail and Guardian's Thought Leadership Dialogue series. Uh, we are live at the Leonardo Hotel in Santon. We've been looking at the impact of climate change, uh, how it affects us, how it affects our cities, and how it affects the insurance that, of course, is so important when it comes to helping rebuild after we have experienced adverse climate events. So I'm going to give my panelists an opportunity to perhaps give me their closing remarks. But before I do that, I'm going to squeeze in one last question uh, from our audience. So yes, sir, if you can just then go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. Okay, um, good, good morning. My name is Gorat Khitsani. I'm an independent public sector consultant. I had uh, one of the uh, audience uh, uh, mentioned global, and I said, okay, how can we talk about climate change and not address resilient cities? Taking the concept of smart cities, uh, building an integrated city, uh, Dora, regards resilience, uh, how ready are we in terms of um, uh, building resilient cities within the uh, South African context? I mean, addressing even, um, I mean, we can go global and talk about uh, Netherlands, uh, Rotterdam. They've got um, innovative um, approaches in terms of building strategies regarding resilient cities. Your comment on that, Dora, thank you very much. Yes, uh, no, I think I, I can safely say that um, cities in South Africa are actually a little bit step um, uh, ahead of the rest of the local government or the rest of municipalities. Uh, a lot of them have been assisted by various institutions, including C40 cities, ITLE, UK Pact, uh, to develop or to put together climate action plans, the city of Johannesburg, city of Cape Town. And there are various interventions that are included in there. And it is all about building resiliency within the cities. Um, but again, broadly within municipalities, because if you address issues at a city level and you don't address the issues at the neighboring, municipality, unfortunately, climate change knows no bounds, uh, just like it knows no bounds between countries and regions. Um, so we are looking at it in an integrated manner in terms of looking at regions. Uh, like, for example, you've got the, the Houghton city region, where cities, uh, the, 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 the three metros would work with some of the districts in Houghton to be able to work on some of the um, initiatives to, 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 to build resiliency. Um, so there is, there is a, a serious pro, uh, program. Uh, cities have got like what is called the climate action plans. In fact, they are far ahead because um, the climate change bill is yet to be passed by parliament. That is going to become mandatory for all of local government to, or, or for districts and metros to produce climate action plans. Johan, the one thing we can't run away from is the cost of the impact of climate change. And, and I wonder from a sustainability point of view, what that risk then presents for the insurance industry? Uh, thank you for the question, and it's very real, and we've experienced uh, significant impacts in the last three years. Um, and the commitment from the sector is how we change the way that we um, underwrite and look at insurance, and particularly uh, some of the efforts that we've invested in is uh, the due coding of, 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 of risks to better understand uh, the risks that individual properties uh, face and then how we can um, act differently in partnership with our clients. So um, uh, we have to change the way and we are on an active strategy to execute on that. All right. So as we get ready to conclude this conversation, then um, I'm going to start it off with you, Andres, to give us your your closing comments. And, and maybe if you can just weave into that, what are the questions that you believe we as residents of these cities, of, of these towns, can and need to be asking, whether it's ourselves or asking our local communities, our local government, um, to ensure that there are, in fact, steps that either we are taking 
or that government is taking to build resilience into our system and into our infrastructure? Uh, okay, as far as I'm aware, the, every um, district municipality has got to have a, a, a climate change response plan. Um, and we have assisted with that in, on several occasions, and we have been in dialogue with that uh, many times, you know, for them to, to assist them with information to develop that. And it is up to the community to ensure that they have knowledge about that climate change um, response plans and this and and um hold the the the, the local um, government to account you know to to actually apply those measures that they say they are going to 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 apply but uh, okay um for the conversation as a whole i will conclude you know that um this is basically about disaster risk and what climate climate change poses to it. And um, these risks are sort of unique to every sector, a climate relevant sector. And a climate relevant sector is every sector that is exposed to um, climate change and variability. And the 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 threats that climate change can pose to every of those sectors are actually unique. So um, from the weather service side, we have done several projects with um, large companies, um, whether it is agricultural or mining and so on, where they have expressed what are their risks, what are their thresholds, you know, that, that will be um, sort of as hardest to them, you know, if it gets surpassed and what are the chances of that happening. And um, so we would like to expand on that, on, on that, you know, because that helps to adapt to climate change. And I think, you know, with the insurance industry, you know, we can sort of um, work together holistically on that problem. All right. Uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, Andres. Dora? Um, look, climate change is a, is a real crisis. Um, and municipalities, both small and, and, and metros, are actually in the front line of fighting this, this crisis. A disaster happens at a local level. All of us live in a municipality. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize that municipalities are not able to shoulder the huge investments that are required to build a, res a climate resilient society that we really m must be building right now. And I think my call to the insurance industry is that our door is open to facilitate partnerships with your with municipalities to be able to determine the vulnerabilities that uh, exist within those communities and start putting together plans not that, that are not going to be just plans, but plans that are going to, be, going to be resourced to be able to reduce the risk of destruction of critical infrastructure and loss of life. It is an all of society uh, 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 work that needs to happen because if you 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 pull back and you you watch and you said there is uh, th there are these problems with local government. Unfortunately, your house, your road is going to be impacted. All right, uh, thanks for that, Dora. Johan, you'll have the final word on this one. And I couldn't agree more than with what Dora has just said. So the most important thing is climate change is real. Each and every one of us in this room and in the audience. Um, would have experienced some sort of impact from from climate change. And the only real way to, to impact that is to consider your own environment and the own community where you live in and, and really take at heart all the actions and every step, as a matter how small it is, uh, to see how you can avert being impacted or to reduce the severity to which you can be impacted. So uh, there's no sooner time to act than doing it immediately. Um, and I think through the partnerships, we can help with the education um, and insurance for it to be long-term sustainable. We've got to find, continuously find measures to help reduce the impact, uh, but no doubt um, insurance then contributes significantly to the overall uh, economic growth. We're certainly not the only player, but it's a very meaningful uh, contributor and uh, we're proud to play that role. 
Thank you so much for that, Johan. I certainly think that one of the big takeaways, at least for me, is that we all need to be better educating ourselves, better informing ourselves about the environments in which we are living in and the environments in which we work in, the industries in which we work in, and how those are likely to be impacted by climate change going forward. Because it's only through that education that we can come up with solutions to mitigate against what the future might have in store. Because that is really what we all, we can only predict, but nobody really knows what the full extent of this cl changing climate is going to be. So let me thank you all uh, for coming onto the show today, for sharing your insights. Our guests, of course, being Johan van Gheneng. Uh, he's a CEO of Standard Bank Insurance Limited. It's the short-term insurance arm of the Standard Bank Group. Um, Dora Marema, Portfolio Head municipal sustainability at the South African Local Government Association, and Dr. Andres Kruger, who's a chief scientist at the South African Weather Service. On that note, that's where we're going to leave it with our special broadcast uh, for today in partnership with Standard Bank Insurance and the Mail and Guardian. I'm sure it will not be uh, the last of the sessions that we have. We will continue with the talking point in a moment. We'll be focusing on government and the land reform uh, program and just taking a look at some of the challenges uh, that those that have been trying to access um, land, what they have been experiencing. So do stay tuned tuned in for that conversation that's coming up after this quick break. Testing one, two. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. You've been absolutely brilliant in the first half of this conversation. That's not where we leave it, however. Uh, we're going to move on to the second half of the conversation. That's going to be facilitated by my colleague, Oliver Dixon. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause, please. Uh, they've been absolutely fantastic. And thank you, too, uh, for your engagement in the first half. I hope that you're going to be equally engaged as we continue. Thank you so much. Can we get this on? Oh, this is on. Great. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second session of this fantastic and important insurance dialogue. My name is Oliver Dixon. I am a radio broadcaster at SAFM. As Kathy said, I am one of her colleagues. And we're going to be continuing this conversation. And I want to introduce my panelists for you this morning. Very, very esteemed panel this morning. We're joined by a uh, personal favorite of mine, Dr. Jennifer, Professor Jennifer Fitchett, who is a professor of physical geography at WITS. Prof, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. We're also joined by Dr. Hadi Nube, who's the head of personal products and at, at Standard Insurance Limited. Uh, lovely. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it, Dr. Hadi. Uh, Dini uh, Nondumu, who's the head of commercial insurance at Standard Insurance Limited, is on the very end of the stage. And he's also joining us, as well as Shaka Zwane, who's the head of insurance and fiduciary, uh, focusing on client coverage, insurance and fiduciary at Standard Insurance Limited. Thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it. I want to start this conversation with a little bit of a personal anecdote, one that I think is important and instructive to the conversation. I grew up in a small little town called Ranfontein. Uh, many people don't know where that is. So for context, it's just after Krugersdorp where all the devilish things were happening, right? It wasn't in Ramfontein, I promise you, we were good. But I grew up in Ramfontein, small little town. Um, specifically, I grew up in a township called Dukomsres. 
Um, my family, my grandfather, started a small little bakery in, in Tukomzeros. Anybody who's from Ranfantin will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll know us as the business that was taken out of business by Butterfield and those guys, right? And my granddad, um, you know, geriatrically ran the thing and became old and realized it was old. And my dad took it over and managed the business. And it was a fantastic business. Um, it took many of us in the family to school, and it's a classic small town township business. Um, the business grew. We started delivering bread to neighboring townships, Mushakeng, Senzele, Simunye, up until Western area, if you're going further west, if you're coming back this way, Kachiso, uh, and, 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 and neighboring townships. And it really, really grew. We started getting these really big industrial bakery ovens that could bake up to like, I don't know, 100 loaves at a time. And at some point, um, there were mechanical breakdowns in the uh, machinery, in, in, in the actual ovens. And uh, to add insults to injury, the roof was leaking at some point. There were heavy rains pouring down, and uh, it, it seeped into the electrical works of, of the bakery and the, specifically the ovens, industrial ovens. And it broke down. We couldn't afford to fix it. The parts were expensive to replace. In fact, the parts, many of the parts weren't locally available. And the business was in limbo, running at a loss to the point where the business shut down ultimately. It was not an insured business. And this morning, thinking about the conversation, I thought about what my life would have turned out like had the business not shut down, where the business would be like, and what my family would have been like from, from a wealth and, and, and material point of view. And this story, albeit happening many, many years ago, is the story of 88%, 82% of businesses that fell victim to the floods in KZN in April 2022. That is quite literally eight in every 10 businesses in KZN in April 2022 were not insured. Many of them had to shut down and are struggling to get back up on their feet. The cost of that to the economy was 65 billion rand. The cost of insurance, the cost of uh, not being insured, um, or at least economical loss of that at a continental wide scale is 1.18 trillion rand across the continent. Just last year alone, in November, uh, the insurance industry saw 35 million rand in claims due to a hailstorm. And this past weekend, um, the golf course I belong to, they're going to be putting in a claim because uh, there was serious damage that happened to um, the, 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 the course as a result of the heavy rains that, that happened this weekend. And so this conversation is about South Africans like myself and my family, South Africans like the people and business owners, family business owners in KZN. And so I want to start here. Jen, I want to start with you. Um, because this conversation ultimately is about how vulnerable am I as an insurance consumer and how can I best be protected? So before we get there, we have to understand the vulnerability and the scale of it. Do we have enough meteorological data that can help us inform the choices we make about what we buy, when we buy it, where we buy it, and perhaps to give us an understanding of the damage that could come from uh, inclement weather? I think it's a very good question. And part of the question is, what is enough? Uh, we've got a really good network of meteorological stations across South Africa. Uh, you heard from Dr. Andries Kruger earlier this morning. We have over 200 South African weather service stations. We've got another large network of stations through the Agricultural Research Council. We've got some of the best climate modelers in Africa who are based here in South Africa and producing regional climate models that are tailored for South Africa. And so we have some of the best information possible on the African continent to be able to forecast uh, on short-term scales and project on long-term scales the type of climate extremes that we face. The problem, however, is that climate extremes are very unpredictable by their nature. And under climate change, these are becoming more and more unpredictable. So we're seeing greater variability. So part of the reason for that is because the, the extreme events themselves are starting to change. The Durban floods is an excellent example. Uh, that particular event is typically ca uh, ca 
characterized as a cutoff low event. So those are responsible for a large amount of rainfall across the Durban region, but also much of South Africa. However, if you drill down to that specific climatology, it's a very unusual event because it starts to represent the type of pattern we'd see in a tropical cyclone. And if we're starting to see new storm types that have never been recorded before, never been observed before, it becomes very difficult to be able to predict when those will happen. Um, so our storm nature is changing, our climatology is changing as climate change is starting to intensify. So it's not only about saying, is an event going to happen more often? Is it going to be greater in intensity? But what are the events themselves and how are those changing in their dynamics? So what data do we then need to collect to fill that information vacuum? So part of it is about uh, collecting data as and when things are happening, and we're doing that. Part of it is very new forms of science. Uh, the Global Change Institute, for example, is looking at attribution science and how we're able to model these types of events and to detect whether or not they would happen under pre-industrial climate or before the effects of, of our increased greenhouse gases. But we also need to be increasing our monitoring networks as best as possible so that we are able to pick up events uh, and to be able to run the kinds of analyses as quickly as possible. Shaka, I want to ask you this. When, when Jen and her really smart colleagues built these models that tell you things, but they also tell you we don't know enough and we don't know what we don't know, what do you and your other smart insurance colleagues uh, do? How do you say to your actuary team, hey, guys, this is the data we have. These people tell us that we don't know enough and we don't know what we don't know. What do you do with that, that sort of uh, uh, meteorological data? Uh, that's a difficult question because I don't deal much with auxiliaries, but I will try and attempt to answer that. And then I'll hand over to Dr. Hadin uh, Mube, who actually deals with auxiliaries on a, on a more regular basis. But I think what is critical, the, the point that uh, uh, Prof has raised uh, uh, here next to me, is that it's important to, to observe patterns. Um, you know, things don't just happen. So the, so, so, so the natural disasters, particularly the floods, uh, which is the focus of the topic today, don't just happen in isolation. Uh, these things do get predicted, even though at times, you know, it's very difficult to predict, particularly the quantum, the extent, et cetera. But what is important is, is to establish the pattern and understand, uh, you know, what is most likely to befall us. And, and insurers largely work on, uh, you know, uh, looking at the patterns historically, and then of course, price for the risk in future. Um, and, and that really is what informs pricing as it relates to actuaries. But as Dr. I say, my, my Dr. Colleague, Nube, does it come does yeah. it become difficult to price for risk when you don't know enough and you don't know what you don't know about future weather events for insurance um, as an industry wide? I don't know what the rest of the world is doing, but in South Africa, how are we faring? Yeah, it definitely does become a bit of a challenge. But because if you don't know what you don't know, you have got to make use of what you know. Uh, from the experiences that we've seen in, in the past and that is coming through as newer types of losses and newer types of storm, these are things that are, br are brought into actual models to calibrate and project on the basis of experience. And as in when we learn, as we go along and learn uh, on what is happening on the ground, then we bring those new nuances into recalibrating these models in projecting into the future what the outcome possibly could. Yep. Can we get Dr. Hardy's mic a little bit fixed? It seems to be cutting intermittently. Um, so we, I would love for everybody to hear him loud and clear all the way into the back. Well, while we get that sorted, perhaps to, to ask you then this, uh, you told us that we need to look to the past uh, to look for patterns, and that will help us uh, see what comes in the future. Dini, I want to ask you this. Um, when we look at contemporary history, what has been some of the most catastrophic storm-related uh, or flood-related uh, uh, events uh, based on what you've been seeing coming through in, in big claims? So, so I think one um, which has been expressed quite extensively this morning is the KZN floods, which, which took place here in South Africa. But we don't exist uh, in an island. You know, these events, are catastrophic flood events, are happening all around the world. I think uh, Italy experienced uh, $2.7 billion worth of damage and losses in their floods in 2021. Then we also have uh, some flood events which took place in the US, another $3.7 billion worth of damage that took place there. So, so I think to pick up on, on Dr. Hardy's point, in terms of looking to the past, in terms of the data that we have, actuarial data and modeling, 
and and historical climatological events and patterns that took place. What used to be referred to as a one in a hundred year event is now becoming more of a one in 50 or one in 20 year event, KZN floods uh, included. I mean, some of, some of the damage and the rain and the patterns that took place in the floods in, in 2022, these were seen in 1973, same floods. These were seen in 1984, same floods going through the same region. So that data that we've gathered there assists us from an insurance industry point of view to better price and model what may happen in future. And, and, and I think that's the role of the very smart actuaries within the insurance industry to be able to price better because as insurers, we're also very reliant on the reinsurance market. Now, the reinsurance market is a global market. So what they will do is they will take their pricing models based on what happened in Italy, based on what happened in Mexico, based on what happens in Australia, put them into their models. And when they price for South Africa, they do factor that in. And that's kind of the cross or global cross subsidization of pricing that we will experience as insurers as we approach the reinsurance markets looking for supports to be able to better insure within the South African region. In, in the previous panel, there was a little bit of a dialectic between uh, Dora and Johan about uh, uh, responsiveness and reactionary behavior when it comes to climate disasters and the management thereof. If we were better prepared for climate management and therefore for disaster response, mm -hmm. um, would we be able to mitigate, mitigate the cost of the impact uh, significantly? We would definitely be able to reduce the impact. I think um, previous panelist uh, Johan did mention it, that it's not just financial that can actually prepare businesses, society, individuals from some of these incidents. Being proactive from a town planning point of view, um, I think the, the professor in the previous panel did mention that some of the methodologies that they use now, they need to update those in order to be able to better the, the, the storm drainage that, that um, Dora was referring to. If you have better technology, more innovative technology being put in place, that is another mitigant that will protect and reduce the impact of these incidents in future. Yeah. Jen, there are people watching this live on the SFM uh, radio uh, platforms uh, and the Mail and Guardian live stream platforms, and they're thinking, my goodness, if I am to buy a house, do I need to find out which city has the best stormwater drain management systems? Uh, how do customers and consumers start making decisions about their lives in relation to the data and information we have about potential disaster? Yeah, so there's a lot of work that's being done in terms of developing livability indices that would be able to tell you relative risk of one area versus another. But what's important to recognize is that climate change impacts and extreme climate events are diverse. And South Africa has a large suite of those. We've got tornadoes. We've got the secondary impacts from tropical cyclones that make landfall in Beira. We've got the cuttle flow systems that results in the floods in, in KwaZulu-Natal. We've got the day zero drought in Cape Town that's occurred. And so although coastal regions are typically more exposed to a greater level of risk and to a greater diversity of risks, we also need to bear in mind that there are no places on Earth that do not experience any type of extreme climate. And so part of it is about not finding that perfect location to live, but in trying to understand and to mitigate your risk for the specific types of events that are likely in your region and to understand how those vary through time and vary through space. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ngobe, uh, to that, and I think this is really important to have a sense of, which insurance category has been most vulnerable from past events? Is it home insurance, car insurance, business insurance? What, what insurance category carries the highest vulnerability and risk? So I'd say a general across the board, we have seen, uh, like you really spoke about businesses, getting out, uh, businesses being affected and getting out of business because they're uninsured. But the predominant area in which this uh, flooding is impacted is mostly within the whole household space where homes are destroyed, contents of homes are destroyed, also to the extent that to a certain extent you find that vehicles are also destroyed uh, or affected in flooding, whether it be hails, hails, uh, hail damage that is experienced in that regard. So I would say the household space is the most affected in this regard. So, so, so homes can do a little bit better. What, what, what then, do homeowners need to know? Is it about protecting 
the physical home? Is it about protecting what's inside of the home? Shaka, how do you speak to a homeowner about their insurance journey? That's a very, very important question, Oliver. Um, because, you know, as insurers, and, and you'd often, you know, hear people say, well, oh, insurers don't want to pay. Uh, it's, it's quite important that households and, and owners of, of, of homes understand what is covered by their insurers and, and what responsibility lies with them. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, if, if you have a house or a home uh, and you don't, you know, do certain maintenance things on a regular basis, uh, and obviously, you know, the, then there's, you know, there's an issue uh, with the house as a result of that. Uh, uh, naturally, because there was no insurable peril, what we call an insurable peril, which means there was no particular event uh, that led into that damage. Uh, we would probably more often than not say, uh, you have to fix that yourself. We're not going to pay for that claim. So I think the message I'd like to get across uh, to all owners of particularly uh, uh, homeowners is to say, uh, maintain what you need to maintain regularly. Uh, and of course, there will always be those disasters that, that are once off that occur that we will then come in and ensure. But you have to play your part. Let's make, let's, make, let's sure make this a little bit more realistic, right? Yeah. There is a 29-year-old professional who had just gotten a promotion into senior management and in true millennial style. They can finally afford their first home, but they just heard that, uh, you know, uh, the interest rate is not doing too well. We're in a hyperinflationary environment, and now you're paying, what, 12% nearly uh, uh, 11.75, I think, on 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 the interest on a bond. You think, wow, that's really really expensive. But I need to get a home. Um, I, you know, my family needs to live somewhere, and I have always told them that I'm going to move them into really nice suburbia with the be most beautiful jacaranda trees. And they think, okay, this is expensive. Gardening service is expensive. Okay, we've got a pool, so now we have to fix that. Mm, okay, I need to pay levies, and those are going up because you know the city of Johannesburg wants their money too. I can't afford insurance. I can't afford home insurance. It, and we must be honest, it's expensive. Uh, but the cost of not having it is a lot more expensive. But how do you psychologically compute that when you have to make that decision? It's actually, you know, if you think of, in fact, if I can very briefly put it this way, if you think of buying any asset, you actually have to think about how am I going to protect this asset? Um, because at the end of the day, that's exactly what insurance exists for, is to actually shift the risk from yourself to the insurer so that in the event that something happens, you actually are insured. How do I know if the asset matters enough for me to protect it? Well, I, I would think that it mattered enough for you to actually have it in the first place. And therefore, if you have it, it actually matters that you protect. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful answer. Uh, Mail and Guardian, you have to run that on your social media uh, sites all day long. That, that, that is the real promo there. <laughs> uh, perhaps to this then, um, how is the industry, Dini, coming together to, to, to manage risk and affordability? To say, look, there is higher risk, but we need to make sure that the access to insurance is affordable, right? How is, and I don't, again, I don't know what the rest of the world is doing, but what's the conversation in South Africa? I think the, the, the key word to that is education, education, education. And that is educating the consumer, be it an individual or a business in itself. I think um, the, the notion that insurance is extremely expensive I, I would dare say is uh subjective at most at, at best and why i say that is insurance cover protecting your assets there isn't a linear way or a single way to do it and this is where the advisory piece comes in as an individual as a business it is extremely important to speak to and consult your financial services provider, your broker, and have them advise you because there are many ways in which you can actually rationalize your insurance cover, either as a business and taking up certain covers that are required to protect what's more important in terms of that business and the operations continuing in the event of a, of a disaster. Likewise, for an individual and for their, uh, their home or their vehicle, et cetera. But you need professional advice. And that is where, as an industry, we don't only have the side of the insurer, we have the side of the broker, and they work together to make sure that the best possible advice and ultimately the best solution for the individual or the business is what's presented to the client, and the client can make that decision 
And some of those levers, once you make those decisions, also become levers where from a financial affordability point of view, you can utilize them. So yeah. Shaka's uh, uh, very famous statement, which you're going to write on, 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 on mail tweet and guardian. It, tweet it, hashtag it, hashtag it real quick, whatever the hashtag may how be. How important is your asset? How important, hashtag how important is your asset? Mail and guardian. Let's go with that. Uh, the SAFM digital team, I'll tell them, they're right outside, I'll tell them right after that. Uh, Dr. Nube, um, th to ask then this, is the industry adaptive to the changes? Are we building better products that are consumer-centered, industry-wide? Yeah. yeah, I think the industry is becoming more adaptive. Earlier, Johan talked about uh, the modular approach to insurance design and solutioning, which in simpler terms basically speaks to what... Uh, uh, my colleague Dini was talking about that creating solutions that you can break into packages and pieces that suits the particular client's need. In that way, the client can also choose what is most pertinent in terms of the insurance that they need. These are solutions that are becoming much more common within the insurance industry. And for our part, especially from a, a standard bank insurance perspective, that the journey that we have embarked on with a view to make insurance affordability, we don't believe that insurance is expensive, but I think to make it much more affordable by structuring solutions that customers can actually package for themselves and avoid leaving a gap uh, that we talked about. The 82% is quite a worrying gap for both, for both businesses and for both insure, uh, for both individuals. So it's quite pertinent that we strive towards that direction in making sure that we can create solutions that help cover this, this, this protection gap that is a big concern. Yeah, we're going to open the floor for questions and engagements in a very short while. So please do start preparing those and uh, raise your hand. And Mike will miraculously come to you. I promise you they'll see you. Um, Shaka, since if we look at the last maybe five years of really catastrophic uh, uh, events, weather events in South Africa as a result of, of climate change and the impact thereof, have more South Africans taken up insurance or has there been a reduction in that or has it stayed statically flat? Well, uh, firstly, I, I just want to point out that uh, there is about a 34, million, 34 trillion gap uh, in insurance out there in South Africa, which means that there are a lot more South Africans who are underinsured or not insured uh, to the extent that they should be. Uh, the industry. Itself, Sorry, what's the difference between underinsurance and sufficient insurance versus not being insured? Okay, so it's underinsurance and basically not being insured at all. So under insurance means that you are insured, but not to the scale and the extent that you should be, given the assets that you've got. Uh, not being insured simply means that you've Again, got assets. Again, that's that not very clear to me. How do you determine what that scale is, and how do you know if you at that threshold? So, so I mean, it's very simple. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not black and white, but it's really about what assets do I have, and what of those assets are insured and which are not insured. So, sorry. So it's okay. So that makes sense. It's about having all the assets that matter to you insured, not absolutely. that you are yeah. undervaluing what the asset is that and not is paying what, enough insurance on the asset. Absolutely. That as well is important because you could have an asset. Is that also under insurance? Is, that's under insurance because you could be, you, should, you could have an asset which is worth, for example, 500,000, but your insurance only is up to 250,000, for instance. Yeah. I'm so sorry if these questions are rudimentary. I'm also learning here about insurance. Uh, I, I might have to speak to uh, some people after this about some insurance products here. Uh, to this, perhaps, and I, and I, and I want to then ask this, um, because I think the best possible way to mitigate against climatic weather, a catastrophic weather event, um, is to slow down gen the impact of climate change as best as we possibly can, right? Um, and... What does that mean and look like, and how do we all come together to make that happen? So climate change mitigation becomes very important then, trying to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are annually uh, revised targets through the COP meetings that um, global players are, are agreeing to, and then there's a lot of monitoring. The last monitoring. COP meeting wasn't that great. Yeah. So there's a lot of monitoring then about what takes place. Here at a local scale, we have the challenge that we are still trying to develop our economies. We're trying to meet the basic needs of our population, but we're also trying to do that in a way where we can try and move towards sustainability targets. 
part of that is a, a major shift towards renewable energy. And for us in South Africa, that has a double benefit of trying to improve our electricity generation capacity, but to do so through renewables such as solar. Uh, there have been major increases over the past year in domestic solar uptake, uh, mostly because people are trying to get around load shedding, but because they are moving towards solar, they are reducing the uh, requirement on coal-fired power. So that's important. Right down to an individual level, it's also about thinking about when we're driving. Are we driving in individual cars or do we have the capacity to carpool? What cars are we driving? What is their level of fuel consumption? Are we leaving lights on unnecessarily in our houses? Those things seem very small, but if every single one of us is making a difference, that multiplies. And I think particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw what individual action can do in terms of having countrywide uh, significant change take place. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. Can we open the floor uh, for some questions? By the way, shout out to Standard Bank. I'm going to plug them here. Um, Standard Bank, for every one rent they spent on fossil fuel uh, project investments in the last two years, they spent five rand on renewable projects. One rand to every five rand. That's, this is an organization that takes serious uh, climate mitigation. So I, I guess that uh, will, will reduce the actuarial risk for you, uh, uh, Dr. Nube. Does it, does it actually reduce the risk if, 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 if you guys calculate, okay, we're doing more to mitigate climate, does it then reduce the risk of climate impact over time? Of course, not in the next five years, but over the next 50 years, potentially over the next 100 years, do we see a, a do we have models that tell us that there's a reduction in that risk that for me as a consumer means that I don't have to pay more and more and more because we're not collectively doing enough? Yeah, my comment in that regard is that of course, each and every business uh, entity globally needs to contribute its little bit to be able to contribute a greater effect on a uh, reduction of uh, greenhouse effect. So as Standard Bank, it is also incumbent upon them to make their contribution. Whilst it might be negligible in terms of what the overall effect from uh, a greenhouse effect component, but the greater combination or the greater efforts by a number of organizations would definitely lead to a reduced greenhouse effect um, and of course begin to contribute to the better outcome in terms of uh, climate change and in that regard we can begin to see maybe lesser extreme events as has been talked about and also as is predicted that the greater the effect on climate continues the more we're going to see of extreme events that eventually affect everybody else yeah Really, really important. Uh, do we have any questions or any hands up? Uh, there's a lovely gentleman here. His name is uh, Gabriello. He'll get a microphone to you. Uh, any questions, engagements, comments, contributions that you'd like to make from the floor? We do welcome that at this stage. No? No hands? You guys are... Oh, brilliant. There's a hand. I was about to say, you guys are very uh, confident about your insurance thinking if you don't have any questions. Not, not at all. That's where the question comes from. Um, you spoke about household cover, and we touched a bit on business insurance, but what other insurance products can protect me that I don't know about? What are the ones that, beautiful. that I don't know about yet? What should I be looking at? Beautiful, beautiful question. Uh, do you want to go for that, Dr. Nova? Yeah, I think we mentioned that purely because we're talking about climate change and the impact of climate change, which is predominantly the damage to the household assets. We have other greater products that we have uh, that are may cover the individual from a personal accident perspective, motor insurance, value added products that we do pro provide. And we definitely have got much more. But I think the emphasis on our side was that looking into the effect of climate change, the predominant impact of climate change is material damage to the assets that you have, which speaks to your building, your motor vehicle, uh, your household contents, all those we insure. Yeah. As we wrap up with this question, I want to ask a general question, and I'll give a, a few of the panelists an opportunity to respond to it, because we just have a minute left. Jen, what, what matters most to you? In life or specific to insurance? <laughs> In life. Um, I think for me, it's it's the ability to be able to enjoy life as a millennial 
in the world that we're currently living in. And what's really important then is to be aware of what we can do right now to be able to ensure that we are living in a world that's still livable in the next 50 years and a world in which our future generations are able to enjoy the same things that we're enjoying today. And I think over recent years, it's become very obvious that that is under threat. Shaga, what matters most to you? I think using the knowledge that I have gathered and gained, particularly within the industry and in banking, I, I happen to be a banker as well, Oliver, uh, but using that knowledge to empower and help people to live better lives. Dini, what matters most to you? I think sustainability of livelihood and, and their insurance impacts. I mean, we're talking about protecting assets, whether it's an individual or, or, or a business itself, but to be able to sustain your livelihood for yourself and your loved ones. I think that really matters most. Uh, when it's crunch time, your loved ones will trump every and anything every day. Absolutely. That's where we're going to leave it. Everybody give a big round of applause uh, to our panel. Really do appreciate it. Uh, we ended with nine seconds to spare. So thank you so much, everybody, for being so detailed, but yet being able to, uh, uh, you know, keep it in good time. Uh, do we have any other questions that we want to get around? Because I did see a hand or two come up. So, uh, let's get, Kabelo, which hand is it? This hand right here. I think I saw a hand in, ma'am, right behind the TV there. Um, there was a hand. There was a hand. Yeah, my sister, you that's looking back right there. We've got you. We've got you. I saw your hand. Oh, you're just stretching. Oh, okay, okay. Go for it, ma'am. There's Andrew. Thank you. My name is Nandi uh, from Standard Bank. Um, the question is to Shaka. What's the real cost of these climate-related events? At ground level, what are the big costs that we're looking at? Sure. Thank you. This is a very, very important question. I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible, but there are a lot of costs to, to climate change. And, and I think the first and the biggest one is the cost of life. Um, uh, you know, uh, in a study conducted in Munich in 2022, it is said that over 30,000 lives were lost because of the devastating impact of climate change uh, and, and the storms and the, and the, and the floods, etc., that comes out of that. So that's a, you can understand that's a, a huge impact. In fact, the same study concludes that 185 million lives were actually impacted by that. So there is a massive impact uh, at, at, at a, a human life level. But I think what is also uh, uh, true is that, you know, there is a real disruption into your day-to-day -day life. You know, uh, I remember during the KZN floods, Oliver, uh, people couldn't cross the road to go to the nearest supermarket to buy the basic essentials. What you found easy to do in Johannesburg, you couldn't do back in, in Tongat, uh, back in Deben, for, in, in, in KZN, for instance. So there's a real disruption in human life. In your people can't get to schools, can't get to uh, community services. They can't have access to hospitals, clinics, churches. There's a real impact mm -hmm. in human life. Jen, is that cost recoverable? I think there's uh, even bigger than just the immediate cost of an extreme climate event uh, and human life, I'd say, is never recoverable. Uh, when we're talking about the costs of then the disruption to our day-to-day -day life, I think those are also difficult to recover. Uh, a day lost at school is profound for a child who's studying for matric. But we also need to recognize that climate change is also having an, a more gradual impact on human health. Climate change has an impact on our uh, likelihood of being affected by respiratory disease. Climate change has an impact on mental health. And there's a growing body of research on the link between climate and health. And to be able to recover those kinds of costs when we're not yet able to really quantify the extent of them becomes really difficult to do and becomes far more insidious in our day-to-day -day life. Yeah, uh, but we can mitigate, I guess, some some of those costs. And we spoke about some of the the mitigating uh, examples uh, in 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 the previous panel. Dora spoke about communities and 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 municipalities, local government institutions having been being climate fit and climate ready. Do we have a sense of what that truly should look like, Jen? I think it's it's about understanding that it does come into every part of how we operate in our cities, how we operate in our private sectors, and being able to try to move towards, on the one hand, mitigation, and on the other hand, adaptation. Broad scale, making sure that we're better able to withstand storms, tornadoes, hailstorms, but also making sure that we've got evacuation plans so that we're able to protect people as and when events occur. Yeah. Dini, 
do you tell a business to be climate ready, uh, disaster ready, and to be resource, disaster resilient? How do you have that conversation? Uh, it goes back to the advisory, the broker that needs analysis. When a broker arrives at the business, depending on the location of the business, how the proximity to the flood line, the proximity to the ocean, the, the structural uh, um, elements of the bu building itself, is it built on a ridge? Is it reinforced? If there's an earthquake, not even flooding, is it going to be able to survive? Are the columns going to break up? All of those things form part of the needs analysis, and that's the advisory piece that is critical before or for any business owner, even a homeowner, and why they should then take up the insurance to make sure that they are protected and advised as to what kind of protection they actually specifically need for themselves. Yeah, and does the stormwater drain system work? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a hand up there. Can we get that? And Avila, which way is it? Oh, all the way in the back over there. My apologies. Go for yeah. it, sir. Thank you. Um, this is Langeli Lemnyandu from Standard Bank. Um, my observation from, I think, when Johan was speaking and with the current panel was that um, a clear role for, maybe a more obvious role for insurance, for the insurance industry to play um, with regards to dealing with this risk and mitigating them is on the education front, so particularly customer education. Um, Johan spoke to that, Dini spoke to that, but I wonder how how that would happen, um, home, home insurance. Um, we've seen with car insurance, you get SMSs, there's also intense advertising that tells you what to do when you are faced with a risk event or a loss event. But from a, a, a home insurance perspective, particularly the structural damage that you may face, I'm not sure whether there's uh, as clear education education drive on that front um, in terms of um, how do you go with, with mitigating the risk that you may suffer as a customer. For example, um, if you look at the landscape of Durban and the catastrophic floods they've been facing, a client may see that maybe their mitigating role would be to fix the structure if there's a crack after heavy rains, but there may be a mudslide or, or something that affects the lay of the land that the property is in. Is the, um, would, would that reporting that to the insurer be something that's considered as a must from a customer perspective that the insurer would consider um, when they're assessing a claim to say, look, there was a shift 10 meters from the structure of the property and that was not um, reported. We did not take any mitigatory steps to um, make sure or assess whether that had an impact on the, the physical structure of the property. Um, and therefore your claim may may be mitigated or, or well, maybe excluded or limited by that. Um, is there an education drive to make sure that clients clearly understand those type of mitigatory steps? Um, That's a beautiful that question. Um, that, that really is beautiful because in, in a sense, if something happens and I don't think it's big enough a deal, but its impact down the line may become bigger, mm -hmm. uh, I, are homeowners, business owners, and insurance customers proactive enough? And are insurance businesses proactive enough in getting those addressed? Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to go for that, Chaga. I'll be brief and I'll ask, uh, I'll palm it over to Dr. Hardy, who's more knowledgeable in this area. But I have to say that we do, we do limited communication to, to, to our clients and, and actually to the society at large. But I have to also point out that it's quite difficult to cover everything um, but the question is quite pertinent because there are some basic things that we have to communicate to people. For example, Oliver, the fact that you have to maintain your house, and I'll go back to that point. There are things that you've, you've got to do as a homeowner on yourself, on your own to maintain your house. Um, and there are things where we come in as, as an insurer. Um, and, and, and so it, we've got to be, so we, we, we've got to be quite clear around what do we communicate. And, and, and I think lastly, uh, you know, it's also up to our clients to make sure that you get as much information as possible when you own a home around what is your responsibility, what should you do annually, what should you do monthly within your house. How do, how do you go about that without it being an information overload, which can be overwhelming? And and that's exactly the challenge, right? And 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 and, and it's but but what also helps is that we do know, for example, when seasons change. Uh, would communicate certain messages that are related to 
now we're getting into winter. So that does help because you're communicating specific messages. When you get into summer, et cetera, and we know what would normally go wrong, you'd start communicating those messages. And that's how you can, can kind, of, kind of partly manage. Dr. Hardy, do you find it difficult to communicate it to certain insurance customers, some of these really dense messages that, like I said, can feel like an information overload that's overwhelming? Uh, not necessarily difficult, but I think it's also about trying to maintain the overload at which time you have to commit, communicate particular issues. For example, Shaka talks about reminding customers, let's say it's pre-rainy season, to make sure that they understand what kind of maintenance they need to do and you advise that kind of... Like what sort of stuff? Is your gutter system working? So it could be... Uh, your gutter system, checking your gutter system that is cleaned up and making sure that uh, all other maintenance related, like the roof, for example, checking out that uh, your roof is still in a good state, that when the onset of rain, you're not going to have uh, ingress of uh, water into your into your, into your your house that may not necessarily be covered in that, that regard. So we give this kind of information. But what I want to add in terms of the specific proactive engagement that we're moving into. So we are, have already procured to geolocation analytics software, which will be part of our approach to engaging customers as they come on board, because then we could gauge much more detailed understanding around the locational attributes of where they are located and educate them as they come on board in terms of the the, the, the flood lines on whether they are on flood line or not, not only from a flood line, but geolocational risk that associated with that. So that gives the client much more information. Also, what we have to do in partnership with the bank is also to give them, uh, as especially within the home loans process, where we give them information about why it is necessary to actually insure their property. Because, you know, sometimes the clients may actually feel that the requirements of insurance as part of your home loans agreement is kind of, kind of an imposition. But once you communicate them about the need and the potential dangers that lie ahead in the instance that they don't have the asset covered, like we always, we talked earlier about ensuring that which matters to you, because if the asset is lost, you may actually remain with a, 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 a legal debt to pay in the absence this, of the This asset. might be an unfair question, uh, but, but I'll, I'll ask you on the question as well during tea. You can't buy a TV in South Africa if you don't have a TV license. It's quite literally a regulatory requirement. Is, yeah. is, is that the sort of environment you imagine that we need to start thinking about? In, in some areas, you can. Like in some African countries, for example, you find that certain aspect of motor insurance, you have got a regulatory motor insurance requirement, especially on the liability side. Mm -hmm. While it's in South Africa, we've got our form of the road accident fund, which we know the challenges with it. In some uh, geographies, there's certain specific requirements for motor insurance, which is legislated. You can't get your license, you can't get your car registered, registered. And as a result, you find that it's much easier to track from that point because every vehicle has some form of minimal insurance required and the point tracking what else in terms of the under insurance levels that makes life easier to be able to target those customers or communicate with those customers so to some degree i think on the motor side there might there have to be some sort of minimal uh, regulation reg we need to get to a point of even transforming the road accident fund to a more regulated structure that we've seen successful in like Botswana and Zimbabwe, for example, on the motor insurance. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have a view on that, uh, Dini? Uh, if you start as business in a specific industry, that it ought to be a regulatory requirement for that to be insured. I don't know if we have mm -hmm. such a regime, but is, is, is that a conversation that could potentially happen? Look, currently we don't, we don't have the regime. And, and I mean, to piggyback off um, Dr. Hardy's point, I think if, if in the previous conversation it came up having a triple P uh, uh, solution drive to some of these issues where between the regulatory bodies, government and the private sector, we put together a solution. On the motor side, I think Dr. Hardy has articulated what some of the regions on our continent are, are doing in terms of minimum insurance in order to be able to acquire or drive a motor vehicle. Now, I think similarly, uh, we don't have in South Africa, but it is a conversation that has reared its head several times over the last 20 to 25 years, wherein we have SIPs to register a company, okay? And you 
may not trade unless you have, and depending on which industry, there's certain license requirements to be able to trade. Now, what we could do from a triple P point of view is partner with the insurance industry and the regulatory bodies in terms of registration of businesses wherein part of the license to trade should include and incorporate some level of insurance for that business. Because it's not just going to be insuring the physical structure of the business itself, but also livelihoods of those employed by the business. Because if the business, in the event of a disaster, is able to, for example, continue to pay salaries of its 10 or 15, especially the SME segment, then you, you are speaking to sustainability of the population itself to be able to have a livelihood. What does that speak to? It speaks to tax revenue being able to continue to be received from a South African broader landscape point of view. And I think if we have these types of conversations a lot more robustly. Do, do we know how to have a continuity conversation? I believe we do. And there are many examples around the world that we can leverage off. We've got Malaysian examples. We've got American examples in Peru. We can leverage and utilize these specifically for the South African environment. So it's not impossible. Models get replicated all the time. It's just about identifying them, sitting around the table, and then being proactive in terms of, right, how do we engage? How do we action it? How do we pilot it to see what works and what doesn't work for us specifically? If, if, if there was a legislator in the room, in, in, in a single line, draw the link between growth and continuity for them. Tax revenue. Brilliant. Jen, also a very unfair question, uh, but piggybacking off of what Tina just said, if uh, businesses were to register, you go and go to SIPs and you register. Uh, some of the requirements, maybe you must tell us who your auditor is. You might have to get a license to in certain industry. For instance, if you're a manufacturer, you have to get a manufacturing license, whatever the case may be. Do you think, again, very unfair, question but do you think all businesses should also concomitantly present a climate mitigation plan as part of a license requirements to trade yep i think that would be a really good way to move towards getting all businesses involved in climate change mitigation but also in understanding climate change and i think the education component that that underpins is really really important uh, we have embarked on a plan of training every single first year student at Wits University on climate change in a climate change and me program. So whether you're a medical student, a lawyer, or someone studying climate, you would have to do a two week course on that before you can start any degree. And so if we can do that in the education space, I think we can also do that in the business space. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We actually have run out of time. Uh, we could really, really do appreciate it. Can we give a big round of applause to our panelists? Really do appreciate it. Dr. Hardy. Jen, um, as well as Shaka and Dini. Yeah, there's a message from you over here. Oh, we're taking a picture. Oh. <laughs> okay, you guys remain here. Yeah? Let me go and have some tea. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate it. <laughs>Thank you all. I was actually not chasing you out of stage, so I just wanted to ensure that the panel remains. Uh, we have some token of appreciation for them. Um, but before I go there, uh, my colleague is getting ready. Uh, I think my take out of the session today is there's a lot of education that we need to drive. So at individual level, um, at community level, to try and mitigate the effects of the severe weather patterns as a result of climate change to our industry, to our assets, and also our personal lives, and as you indicated, Prof, even our state of mind, right, our mental health. Um, so with that said, I think the conversation will definitely continue beyond these four walls. Um, we have a role, and we actually do drive that awareness as Standard Bank Insurance, and we will continue to do so, but I also believe that the industry at large is also going to be doing the same. So it's really for us to continue driving the awareness and hopefully uh, have these dialogues and continue with them and not only limit them to, to this session. Uh, with that said, I actually do want to uh, request again that we give the first panel and the second panel a round of applause. It's been a very insightful session. Okay, and then in the interest of time, I will pass the token of appreciation to my colleagues and panel on this side, and then we'll be able to get to the panelists that were with us earlier uh, with your with your gifts. Um, and then for the rest of the team, um, so the guests that are in the room, 
Uh, we are going to be moving to the seventh floor uh, where lunch is going to be served, and um, it is the restaurant that is uh, available to all of us. So when you get your, when you get there, um, you can have free seating. Um, there are colleagues who are going to be directing you in terms of like where to go once you get to the seventh floor. Um, yes, so Joe, um, there's also a request for pictures for all the panelists uh, just outside uh, the, the, the room, right? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so the two panels, uh, we are requesting pictures. Would you like the pictures on the stage here or do you want them outside? So on stage here, if you can, please hold and then we'll also just gather everybody. Um, thank you so much. So Joe, what do we have? Um, I think this one. Uh, let me start on the far left. I don't see. 